Thank you, Lord, that you are bringing about a season of shift and of change. That you are shaking everything that can be shaken so that we might receive an unshakable kingdom. And we ask, Lord, that you cause a cleaning up and a clearing away in our nation. We ask, Lord, that you would release to us newness, a new vigor in terms of honesty and integrity through the nation from the highest office right down to local level. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen, amen. Fantastic. Super. Really appreciate the the, the way in which you go after these prayer times, it's super, super powerful. And uh, so I uh, really appreciate it. Thank you so much, family. It's a day of thanksgiving. It's a day of celebration. And uh, we had just a, a wonderful time in, in our worship with Peter McCarthy. He had been with us a number of years ago as part of the, the team here. And uh, for the last five, six years or so, he's been pastoring down in Durban and uh, amongst the students there, and they're having an absolute ball. So uh, uh, it was just so good for us to, to have Peter with us this morning. It was also good for us to uh, have Gwen uh, with us leading worship, and uh, Gwen is relocating to Cape Town, and so this was the last time that she was part of the team and leading worship. So we just want to say cheerio, Gwen. God bless you. So appreciate your, your ministry and being part of the family like this. So, so good. Yeah. And then, um, you know, just Thanksgiving is a time for celebration and for presence. And so we have a gift this morning in the form of Sorrel van der Merwe. And um, you, you might have known of that famous racing driver. This is not him. Yeah. We, we've, got, we've got something far better than somebody can just drive cars fast. We, we have a father in the faith. He's been a father figure to many across this nation. Um, Sorrel and Tisa have led Theologos, a training college, and have been instrumental in raising up the standard uh, within the body of Christ ac across the nation. And uh, it really is such a wonderful privilege uh, for Sorrel to be here. He was actually meant to be here while we were away on sabbatical, and uh, somehow things just didn't quite work out. That was a year ago. But you know what? He's got better. <laughs> He's had a whole year to improve. And uh, so, Sorrel, thank you so much for, for coming through, and I really appreciate um, Sorrel's been recovering from some, from some surgery um, but this was not going to hold him back. This is just shows you the heart of this immense giant in the faith. So would you put your hands together and would you welcome Sorrel? Thank you. Thank you. You may be seated. It's really awesome to be with this amazing family. I've been many times here, normally sitting somewhere. And uh, it's just awesome to be here in front and uh, sharing my heart, my passion. Um, I've changed my sermon twice this week. <laughs> so uh, uh, it's not that God is confused, uh, just that I, I didn't want to preach on what I'm going to do because I felt that you guys are so mature and perfect. Uh, I need to give you very intense theology. And, uh, but God brought me back to my famous topic. Um, and uh, so here I am. And I'm not here to just do a, some teaching. I really want to impart something from heaven in your heart that will change you forever. Now my topic is it's been my favorite topic since I became a Christian. And uh, even before I've been a Christian, I've experimenting in, in, you know, getting miracles to operate through prayer. And uh, I've tried to raise my chickens 
when the dog killed them. Um, and, you know, the Bible said, pray, you will receive. So I've tried that. And uh, the chickens didn't come back to life. But I, at least I've, I've started to practice what the Bible says. And uh, expecting that there's something supernatural beyond what we can see. Um, now, the fact that you are here means that most of you are Christians. And the fact that you are calling yourself a Christian means that you believe that God actually exists, that he's here in this atmosphere. Although we can't see him, he's here in the spirit. We can touch him. He's here to speak to you, to embrace you, to give you a unique experience with him as the creator of your life. So uh, I want you to open up your mind, your heart, to what God has called you in, that you are actually supposed to work with heaven to change this world. That's your highest call. Uh, you are not here just to say yes to Jesus and go to heaven. That's the easy part. The real part is, after you said yes to Jesus, to say, all right, Lord, what must I do now? Now, for each one of you here, there's a different calling and a different anointing and gifting. But the most important thing that you need to do is the one that we do the least. And we are all guilty. And for us as preachers and pastors and trainers and leaders, we'll all agree one of the most difficult things to get our people to do is to get them to pray. I know it's very quiet here in this Roman Catholic Church, but uh, <laughs> the most difficult thing among Christians to get them to do is to pray. And some of you, I mean, I think most of you pray at least five minutes a day. They did a, the, some research in America for what that's worth, that among the leadership of the church people, the average time they spend in prayer was three minutes per day. Leadership. Um, and we want to change the world. Now, we are all guilty because we, we have missed it over and over. For me, it's like knowing everything and still not doing it right. Once I've been in Pemba, I preached my heart out to a group of Bible school students there. Um, they're young men, young people, knowing Jesus maybe for a year or two, and they are eager to, to evangelize, to plant churches. So I was preaching there, telling them how to do spiritual warfare and how to pray and do things like that, because I, I've got 40 years of theology behind me. And then we went to another venue where it was a big venue, and one of the young guys sitting in front of me in that class, they asked him to just testify what happened that month with him. This is a guy who knows Jesus less than a year, and they asked him to testify about what God used him in. And, and he was telling very simply how God led him to raise five people from the dead. And I was sitting there and thinking, man, I'm supposed to do that. You know, I've got a lot of training and I haven't raised one from the dead. I mean, maybe this morning, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, we have a lot of knowledge we know what's right, and still we do not operate in the power that heaven gives us to operate in. And then we complain because things are not happening. Do you realize that most of your crisis and issues and problems and accidents and incidents that's happening to your life could be avoided if you have prayed correctly 
and dedicated and continuously, you, have, you could have changed the atmosphere in which you operate by doing the right things through your obedience and repentance and just interceding and fighting and, and enforcing heaven on earth. You can change your environment. You can change your future. Your life is in your choices to, to obey God and to do what he has called us for. Now, I want to venture into this this morning because I'm, you know, I'm watching my own people and people we love over so many years, and I'm still shocked to see how few are actually praying. Even while I've heard a hundred sermons on the necessity of prayer, they still don't pray. Then I'm asking the question, if you know what the Bible says about prayer, why are we not doing it? Uh, why are we not driven to do it better and more? Now, I'm trying to get to that question because the fact that we don't use prayer to change the environment means that we don't believe in prayer or we don't believe in what God can do or we're just too lazy to be used by God. Many people say, man, we can, cannot change South Africa. It's too far down the drain. Let's pray for the rapture and get out, <laughs> even if you don't believe in it. <laughs> Most people don't care about life, so they don't do anything to change it. We have people lining up every week for prayer, calling us online, Pray for us, pray for us, pray for us. Then you wonder how much time did you spend yourself in prayer to change your circumstances? You want me to pray, my team to pray. You haven't spent five minutes in serious prayer yourself. You want me to do it for you? What about growing up and do it yourself? Change your environment by doing what God has called you to do? Now, my purpose here today is not to teach you the detail of how to pray. My purpose here, and I, I trust I'm hearing what God is saying, is to stir you up to a place where you realize God wants to use you to change your own future, change your family, change your business, change things that's happening around you because you have the ability to, 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 to be connected to heaven and bring down what's heaven to earth. Amen. And I, I was trained, some of you know, I was trained as an NGO Domini, Dutch Reform Domini. And then I was trained for many other things. That's not important now. And never anyone taught me that through prayer I can change the future. They never told us that. The closest we got to prayer was just to sort of say thank you for our food. As a little child, I had to go with my parents to every Wednesday night prayer meeting at the church. And we were about five people there my father, mother, me, and the org organist, and uh, Dumni. And I had to be there, you know, and it was so boring to hear people pray. And somehow we've missed the whole purpose and method and understanding of praying. I've been in many prayer meetings from Pentecostal, charismatic, Boskerk, I've been in many churches where people pray, and then at the end I realize, what are we actually doing? Is this just another ritual, or are we changing, bring heaven down? We, do we really believe it's possible? Now, I want to just here in the beginning sh share quickly with you a few scriptures about the necessity of prayer, and that's just to, to stir you up, and then I want to challenge you about the, the mindset of the world we live in and maybe what you are living in. So if we can, uh, okay, that was just my first picture there, um, just to get you to where we should be and uh, that uh, God is calling us. Uh, and we will ask the questions a few times this morning. 
if prayer is really so important, why do we only spend a few minutes on it, even in services? I've been in churches, I have the privilege to be in some of the biggest churches in the world where 100,000 people are praying for 24 hours nonstop. I've been in churches like that. I've been in, in the church in America years ago where they started with an early morning prayer at six where they got a million people praying every morning at six all over America together. And I've been in those meetings because I wanted to see, wow, where do you get this flow, this anointing, this, where is coming from to get mobilized a million people to pray every morning for an hour? I've been twice in Korea in that church where where they have people praying, minimum 10,000 people at any time praying every day. You get there and you feel like, maybe I'm not a Christian yet. These people are taking this serious to change the world. And we think we can get away with five minutes and change the world and our business. And we haven't prayed until, like Jesus, until your sweat becomes like blood. We haven't fought until we had to break through. We, we, we want it easy. So just a few scriptures quickly to bring you into the environment of the kingdom. After they've prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. I want you to hear, after they have prayed, and I want you to hear the word praying in all these scriptures. Philippians 4, 6, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. I mean, this is Paul, simple lifestyle, in everything. Present everything, your needs, your, your, your desires in prayer and petition. Now, that's a great topic to pray. What is petition? What is thanksgiving? What is prayer to ask? There's a lot of, uh, you know, intercession, praying in the Spirit, those questions we need to ask because a lot of us say we are charismatic, we are Pentecostals, we are full of the Holy Spirit, we will seldom pray in the Spirit. While God has given us dynamite resource to use. 1 Timothy 2, 1. First of all then, I exhort that petition, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made on behalf of all men. Again, Paul is giving us a method of praying here. Petition, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving. And then he continues, first of all, pray for the leadership of a nation, the kings, and for all those who are in authority that we may lead a quiet and peaceful life peaceable life. That's what we need in South Africa, in all godliness and honesty, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior, who will want all men to be saved and to come un into the knowledge of truth. So what is our strongest evangelistic tool? Prayer. What is the most powerful thing to change our government? Prayer. Thank you for the amens. Hebrews 5, 7. This, this is a shocking scripture. and I bet that many of you have never read it. During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with loud cries and tears to the one who could save him from death, and he was hurt because of his reverent submission to Father. Jesus spent time in prayer and the, the, the author of the book of Hebrews most probably was one of the, the disciples around him, someone who knew him well, someone who listened when he prayed early in the morning or through the night. He knows what Jesus, the sacrifice he brought to accomplish his calling and his destiny. Loud cries and tears. Acts 4.21, they raised their voices together. That's, we call it cooperative prayer together in prayer to God. Matthew 12, 29, or again, how can anyone enter a strong man's house and carry off these possessions unless he first ties up the strong man, then he can rob his house. The strong man is the 
enemy. Our warfare is not against flesh and blood. And then Paul says four levels of demonic atmosphere. And we want to rob the enemy from his people. We want to see people saved. We want to change the environment. Uh, are we prepared to bind the strong man through our prayers, through our worship, to spend time in? This is war. This is the reality of us being. This is not a cruise ship. This is a warship. We are called to fight and have an attitude, a lifestyle of fighting. So much as we worship, and I love to spend time in worship, but out of worship, because that is when we connect to Father, then it turns around. Then Father works through us to change the environment. So you are always start of worship. You come into the presence. From the presence of Father, where we sit in His right hand, we release what's in heaven to earth. So don't try to do intercession without being aware of you seated with Christ in the right hand of the Father. That's your position from where you pray. We call it active prayer. Most of us, when we listen to your prayers, is what I call passive prayer. Oh, Lord, help me. That might be a good prayer to start with. Help. <laughs> Sometimes more, you know, help. That's, that can be a powerful prayer. But you know, your first calling is to enter into the presence. From the presence, you become aware that you are clothed with glory and with the outfit of Jesus Christ. And then when you open your mouth, I'm acting on behalf of heaven. What Jesus says comes out of my mouth. What's on the agenda of Father comes out of my mouth. You need to live so close to Father that when you open your mouth, you are saying what heaven says. Otherwise, we pray our own agendas that has no value. I need to be in harmony with heaven so that when I open my mouth, what's in heaven is coming out of my mouth. So it calls for you for intimate relationship with the Father. Just a few other scriptures, Romans 8, 26. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, most of us but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans that the world words cannot express. Continues, and he who searches our hearts know the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints in accordance with God's will. To make it very simple, we need to allow Holy Spirit to pray through us. Not now and then, daily. I need Holy Spirit to pray through me because he prays according to the will of the Father. And most of the time, we don't have a clue what to pray. We pray selfishly. Lord, help me this. Help me in this meeting. Give me wisdom here. And it's great things to ask. But you have to get beyond that where you allow Holy Spirit to pray through you, not only worshiping God, but through you to change the atmosphere. We need to be connected to him. That calls for maturity. And as mature people, we need to know how to pray. When I was in, in Korea, I mean, their focus on prayer is so powerful that every new Christian, the few, first thing they, they teach a new Christian is to pray for one hour every morning. That's just basic Christianity. Pray for an hour each morning. That's why you find them on the prayer mountain. You find them through the night prayer. They pray for hours because they got fit in praying. They just know that when I pray, something happened. Do you really believe when you pray, something happened? Come on. If you really believe that when you pray, something happened, why are you not praying? Because everything you want to change in your life can be changed through your prayers. Not just pray, pray you know, sim simple prayers can be powerful. But the, in the book of James, it says, you don't have because you don't pray. Then he continues, he says, you don't have because you pray selfish prayers. So the one thing we're guilty of, not praying. Secondly, we pray wrongly. If we learn how to pray the will of God instead of your own desires, then things will change because I'm praying what's on God's agenda. And I want to find his agenda. 
in all situations, pray in the Spirit with different kinds of prayers, Ephesians 6, 18. In all situations, pray in the Spirit with different kinds of prayers. And actually, if we would go in that and I teach you how to pray in the Spirit, different kinds of Spirit prayers, you get different kinds of praying in the Spirit. But you need to grow up and mature in it. It's like Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12, he says, uh, I don't want you to be ignorant about the things of the Spirit. And then he continued about teaching about the gifts of the Spirit operating through that. You cannot afford to be ignorant, uneducated, foolish, stupid, sorry for the strong word, about the things of the Spirit. If you want to be used by God, you have to educate, you have to get acquainted with the things of the Spirit and sense it and move with the things of the Spirit. And if you really believe that, that prayer can change things and prayer is the, 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 the catalyst for bringing revival, why are you not at the prayer meeting? <laughs> And I'm, I'm asking it for my own people, you know. Some of our leaders, they've heard me a hundred times about the necessity of prayer and they still do not come. <laughs> Yom Cho of that big church in Korea, if, if one of his people are not praying, he sent them for a month to pray mountain for discipline. Go and pray for a month on the mountain until you learn to pray. Uh, he expects from his pastors to pray minimum three hours a day uh, to become a pastor. Uh, and then we all fail in that. I, I just want to stir you up about the reality of living in this world and we want to change it. Now, I know some of you are evangelistic in your heart. You like to testify and preach and do things. It's awesome. But you can't do that without first praying and fighting and interceding. Some of you like to preach. Whatever you love to do or even give food out, everything must be surrounded and prayed through. Your intercession, open the door for what you come after that. If you watch missionary organizations, when they go into new areas, the first season, month, or even a year, they only pray for that area before they move in. You start a new business, you start a new ministry, you have to spend a lot of time in changing the spiritual atmosphere before you go into that. You need to understand that nothing will manifest in the physical before you have won it in the spiritual. You will not have physical breakthrough if you did not win it in the spiritual. And that's hard work. It's hard work, it's not easy. But we are not called for easy. We are called to be dedicated. You know, when Jesus was fighting in the spirit and he was sweating like blood on that mountain and his disciples, they were sleeping and he turned to them and he said, can't you not tarry one hour with me? Can you just stay in prayer for one hour with me? And then he come back, they were still sleeping. And that's the condition of the church. Asking a church to pray for an hour, man. We get a few older ladies that comes. I was just watching a video yesterday of revival in Indonesia. Guess who's the front prayer warriors? Youth, young people, on their knees. Young people praying for hours. Man, that, that looks so beautiful. And that's, that's where we move. We want men and young people on the prayer movement right in front understanding that the revival is, is an overflow of our intentionally uh, intercession. There's so many scriptures in the Bible that say pray without ceasing, pray continuously, pray without stopping. It's just scripture after scripture after scripture. This is the topic in the Bible. Every page you page, you will find the scripture on someone praying. It's the most important activity and discipline for Christians. Praying, praying, praying. Now, I would love to listen to you when you pray. I, I do it a lot. I listen to people when they pray. Jesus actually did it also. He was listening to, to them. And he was watching those who put money in. 
And I, I love to listen to people when they pray because your prayer reveals your heart. Your prayer tells me where are you in your relationship with God. I know. I want to hear when you pray over the food. And, you know, we make jokes about praying over the food. Segen vader, segen sop, en elke worm kop, you know, those kind of prayers. Um, those who understand heavenly language. Um, we, we have so much, and, 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 and even some of you, when you pray over your food, you're still praying rhymes, little sentences, you repeat the same stuff every week. Somewhere you lost connection with God, you know. My, my grandchildren, who's three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, I mean, there's nine of them. <laughs> we're sitting around the table. During this lockdown time, seven of them were in my house. I mean, and they want to pray. And I'm listening to these little ones praying, and I think they're actually praying more powerful than most of the adults I know. Because they know Jesus, and they do it simple. And they watch the, the food and say, nummy food, thank you, Jesus, for nummy food. <laughs> and they make it so simple and so powerful. And, and you know, the way we talk to God reveals whether you actually have a relationship. It's like when I, I watch you with your wife, husbands, and wives with your, the way you, you talk reveals relationship. Communication is, is the way of building intimacy. The greatest way of intimacy with God is our worship. And then we listen what he's saying back. And we do what he's saying. And I, I remember my own life before I became a Christian. The Duomni forced me to pray, you know, at a prayer meeting. I, I nearly... Can't, may not say it here, but I nearly wet my pants, so we cancel it. But I was so afraid to pray. I couldn't pray. Because it was just one big issue. And recently, one of the older guys who I counseled, I said, all right, I, I want to help you to pray. He said, I cannot pray. I said, I will help you. Just say with me. So I was just saying basic words. Father, I love you. And Father, I love you. I come today to dedicate my life. And he was just praying after me. And I realized he is a guy who has been in church for 40 years, 50 years. He cannot even pray a simple communication to Father. What about doing real intercession? <laughs> Changing the atmosphere. Are you still here? Why is the Bible so loaded with scriptures about prayer? And we, we work our way around it. There's, there's one scripture in prayer. Maybe I must just, uh, I wanted to start off it, but let's just read it now. You can just listen. It's Luke 18. This, I think this is one of the most significant scriptures in the Bible about prayer. Luke 18. It's a simple story, but it tells you a thousand principles. Luke 18, verse 1. Then Jesus spoke a parable to them that men always ought to pray and not lose heart. Always need to pray and not lose heart. Saying, there was a certain, in a certain city a judge who did not fear God, not regard man. Now there was a widow in that city. Now the widow represents us who are dependent. There was a widow in that city, and she came to him saying, give me justice for me from my adversary. And he would not for a while, but afterwards he said within himself, though I do not fear God nor regard man, yet because this widow troubles me, I will avenge her, lest she, her continual coming, she wear, weary me out. Then the Lord said, Hear what this unjust judge said. And shall God not avenge his own elect who cry out day and night to him 
cry out day and night to him. Though he bears long with them, I tell you that he will avenge them. Avenge means he will come through for you, give you breakthrough, speedingly. I like that, speedingly. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on this earth? Now, Jesus is connecting your faith with your ability to keep on praying. Pray without stopping. Knock without stopping. Seek until you find. There's, there's a pressure on us to keep on, keep on, keep on. Even if you don't see fruit, you keep on. Even while you call out to God and a solution that comes is not the one you wanted, you, 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 you believe that God is in taking control because you've prayed. So the question, why are people not praying? Most people believe, and maybe many of you here believe in chance, fate, luck, and the philosophy behind it we call determinism. You will be amazed how many among you and your family and your friends and people in the church, and I've been raised in a church environment that, that believes in determinism. What is that? What happened will happen. If the, if, if the plane will fall in this city today, no one can stop it. You know that most people, and I'm counseling people for nearly 40 years, and people will sit and say, God killed my child, God stole my money. They blame God for everything. The world around us are believing that what happened will happen. And you can't change it. And I want to tell you today, I want to shake you out of this lie. You can change your future. God, if, if we can't change our future, why would God insist on, on us praying? If you cannot change your business and change your family and, and save your marriage and change things, by the way you pray and your fighting in the spirit in your declarations, why would God insist us praying if we can't change the future? I want you to realize the responsibility is on your lap. Your future is on your lap. It's in your mouth. It's in your choices. You can moan and groan and say everything is against me and God is against me, the devil is against me. No, no, your future is in your choices to do what God has called you. And maybe you have failed in some things up to now, but you are, are in an opportunity to change it and to improve on it. We all fail in things. Until you do it again and again and again, you become better. The first few people I prayed that was very sick, they all died. Until I kept on praying and some got better. And then I start seeing some miracles coming through because I kept on praying as I, God said, pray, heal the sick, and I will keep on healing the sick until I see some fruit coming. I don't stop because the first time it didn't work. You keep on, keep on, keep on until you have a breakthrough. You keep on praying, you keep on praying, even if your mind does not understand the dynamics, what's happening, you keep on doing what you know is right. You don't stop praying. You don't stop asking. You don't stop knocking. You don't stop seeking. You keep on, keep on, keep on until there's a breakthrough. So this is not for sissies because they give up easily. This is for those who really want to conquer, who want to see victory, want to break through and have the fruit of that. Never use the words, oh, you're a lucky person. Luck is a demon. We are blessed, like we've sang it today, because of Jesus. And we are increasing in our blessings because we are aligning with heaven. And the more we align with heaven, the more the blessings will manifest in our lives. So there's an increase of blessings because of your, your pressure, your, your, you, you seek obedience, you seek the heart of God. We are blessed in Christ. 
Jesus is not going to die again. He paid for everything already. The only thing that needs to change is us aligning with what's already in heaven. And the more we align, the more we see heaven breaking through in our lives. And if something is not working through, you still go on. Even if you pray for your mother who had cancer and she died while you were praying, you, you pray for a next cancer person. Actually, if you study Bill Johnson, for most of you know him well, uh, after all your teaching and stuff, you know, when his dad died of cancer, that week before his dad died, he was preaching on healing. The week after, he was preaching on healing, and he prayed for his dad, and dad died with cancer. And what did he do? He, the next Sunday, he called out people who have cancer to come, and he had more results and more breakthrough than ever in his history because he said, I will not stop praying for people and trust God for complete healing. The fact that it did not work once, man, just give you more tenacity. I will win this thing. I will pray through. I will pray until it works. I will keep on because God is the healer. I don't understand why this is not working, but I will press in to see this coming through in Jesus' name. So the whole gospel is about taking responsibility to obey, to move where God says move. For us who want to mature, grow up as Christians, it's all about hearing God and doing what he's saying. Last week I preached there with our church, I think it was last week, on just grow up. <laughs> that was my topic, just grow up. <laughs> And it seems like talking to little ones. But you know, the Bible says, that the, the author of Hebrews say, there's many things I want to teach you, but you are still babies. I can't teach you real stuff. So I have to get back to basic. And if you see the six things he mentioned there as basic theology, that's the things most of us keep busy with the rest of our lives. That's basic stuff. We have to get beyond it. And beyond it means make disciples growing in maturity, changing the world. And God is calling us all to grow up, to actually to be instruments in his hands, not just beggars standing and give me, give me, give me, that most of us actually live for the rest of our lives. Your prayer life, and this is a bit stepping on your toes, so I love you. Your prayer life reveals your relationship with God. It reveals your kind of faith, it reveals your identity in Christ. It reveals your theology, your understanding and knowledge of God's principles of abundant life. The way you pray and, and if you pray and whether you pray and how long you pray all reveal how do you perceive God? How do you understand his word? And man, I've been among a lot of pastors, leaders, and sometimes I'm just shocked. I've seen powerful prayer warriors. I love them. I've, I'm connected to international intercessors. I love to see them pray. I've been at prayer meetings. You know, at least people are trying. So I don't want to be negative. At least they are praying, even if they're praying like children, but they are trying. And I'm just shocked sometimes when you're among people who are supposed to mature and they still pray like little children. And I, I want to, to gently step on your toes because I want to urge you to change the world. <laughs> I want you to break out feeling sorry for yourself and want someone else to change your circumstances because it's in your hands. You have all authority to change things around you. You can change, open your mouth with the authority of Christ and see things happen. I get it a lot that people say, Sorrel, you must pray because when you pray, things happen. No, no, no. Your prayers is exactly the same as, as mine. I want you to pray. And sometimes great to take someone who is a beginner to say, all right, here's someone with short legs, one short leg. Now I take this beginner and say, all right, you put your hands on. I want you to say, grow in Jesus' name. And they say, grow in Jesus' name. <laughs> that foot, leg is coming out. And they, I'm standing there, but they've done it. And I want to see beginners doing 
what we are called to do because you can do it. I remember the first time when I prayed for someone and there was healing. First time when I cast out the demon out of people. Man, that feeling of, wow, God used me. But you have to grow and become used to be used. You have to get used that when I pray, something happen. Can it become your motto of life? When I pray, something happen. Can you say that? You, you'd better believe it. When you pray, something happen. Because that's what God taught us, pray. And prayer is not just give me, give me, give me. Prayer is to take what's in heaven and release it on earth. And you need, you need to get used to what's in heaven and what's the will of God. If prayer is so important, why are so few people praying? Is it just laziness, uneducated, or they don't care, or they're just ignorant? The shocking thing is that many churches are not praying at all. I remember in my reform days when I was part of the reform churches, those years of, you know, you mix with other reformed churches. And I was just shocked to realize that some churches blatantly said that they don't pray because that was part of the, the first church. They needed to pray. Now we have everything. So they don't pray. They don't pray for the harvest because they believe in the election. God will elect some people and save them. So we don't pray because God already decided who he wants so they don't pray. They don't have prayer meetings. They never pray. Just don't pray. This is churches. Now, maybe you are operating on the same mindset. How, how are your home being filled with prayer? If there's a crisis, are you praying immediately? Are you calling your children? Whoa, whoa, let's pray. Before we do anything, let's first pray. We are in an accident, first pray. Our money is stolen, let's first pray. Everything we do is about first pray. My wife is so great in that, better than me. I mean, I've been in, in, in I remember driving up in Africa through a pothole and explosion of your tire. And immediately I realized there's no living soul close to us here that's going to help us. And I, I immediately feel sorry for myself. We're going to be stuck here for days in the middle of Africa. And that's going through my mind. My wife said, come, 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 let's pray. <laughs> you need a wife like that. And she prayed, Lord, you, you can save us out of this. We declare that there's help on its way. We will have a solution. She was just praying faith, calling in. Man, one minute after she started to pray, a truck came, Bucky. A Muslim guy, stop, can I help you? And he helped us. He took me in with the broken wheel to a place where it's been fixed, and he brought me back, 40, 50 kilometers back. My wife prayed <laughs> when I forgot. <laughs> you see, you, our lifestyle should be so entangled with prayer. Every little thing happening, first pray. At business, at work, first pray. Are you opening your prayer, your business daily when you get in your office? Let's first pray. Everything should surround around your prayer life. You're getting around the table. It's so important for families to sit around the table every night or whenever it's possible. Every morning, let's pray. My three sons would remember when they were small, every morning after breakfast, before they go to school, I lay hands on them, bless them, bless them, bless them, every morning before they go out. It was just our lifestyle. Everything we did, it's just pray, pray, pray. And I want you to urge you, your life must be totally saturated with prayer. If prayer is really so important, some people have a saying, God is in control. God is most in control, just as some Afrikaans. And it's, it's the most deceptive words that you can use. God is in control. 
I want to shock you out of your theology. God is not in control. Because when you say God is in control, you actually say, let's do nothing, God will sort this out. And it's a lie. God is only in control, listen, where people pray, where we take authority, when we bring heaven down, then God, through us, comes into control. Stop just saying on Facebook like many people are doing, you know, don't worry, God is in control. By saying that, God is not going to change the government. It's for those who pray, intercede, and fight, and do things that will change the government because we are on our knees and we're doing our homework. It's easy to just say, don't worry, God is in control. It, it sounds very religious. And it's actually a cop-out from taking responsibility. But maybe the situation that you are in, God is not in control. God can be in control if you allow him. God is the ruler of the universe. But he's not necessarily in control of what's happening on this planet. That's why he has a church. That's why he needs Christians that can open their mouths on behalf of heaven to bring things under his control. I want you to hear this. Don't go through cheap theology, cheap thinking. You know, God is doing everything, so let's just sit on a stoop and watch the grass grow. That's what most people are doing. While your greatest calling from God is to be an intercessor, I want to really, and I'm, I'm getting closer to my landing here, the greatest calling that God has placed on your life is to be an intercessor. It's more important than anything else to intercede, to stand in the gap between heaven and earth. And we intercede in one way, worshiping God turning it around to bring heaven down to earth. You are called to be an intercessor. And it's, the, it's a major call. It's, it's loaded with authority and responsibility if we pray and stop saying, I don't care, don't bother. I mean, the rapture is coming. Let's wait for it. The Antichrist is taking over. Actually, I saw a pastor wrote it recently on Facebook. What is this all about trying to get the Christian government and that, you know, we know the Antichrist is going to take everything over. So, man, why fighting this? I mean, how, how stupid people can get. So I pray that God arrange a special rapture for that guy to take him away. <laughs> For us who are kingdom people, we are here to establish the kingdom. We are here to enforce the kingdom, and we do it through our worship and our prayers. We are aggressively advancing the kingdom forward. It's hard work. It's dedication. It takes your time, your effort, your energy. We are enforcing the kingdom. It's a responsibility, and it can be fun. So why do we pray? To communicate with God, to have fellowship with Him, to get answers, to get what He's been promised to us, to receive the fullness of what Jesus paid on the cross, and to be rewarded with joy. And I will read your scriptures on that now, to declare heaven on earth. I think this is one of the most beautiful scriptures about prayer. John 16, Jesus said, in that day you will ask me nothing. Most assuredly, I say to you, Whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. That's a blank check. Until now you have asked nothing in my name. And then comes the reason for praying, the main reason for praying. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. What is God's desire for you? Fullness of joy. How is fullness of joy coming? By answered prayers. So God wants your joy to be full by when you ask and receive, you are rejoicing in God doing what you've asked. So how can you have joy if you don't pray? How can you have joy if, if you don't ever see testimonies or hear testimonies of miracles coming through? Your joy is in seeing God in action. Wow, he has done it again. That's why testimonies is so important, because it stirs up the joy among us. 
to say God is faithful all the time. He's good, 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 daddy, every day, always. And now just my last challenge on you on intercession. Isaiah 62, I have posted watchmen on your walls of Jerusalem. They will never be silent day or night. You will call on the Lord, give yourself no rest. Now this is a scripture out of the Old Testament about Jerusalem that God used prophetically in our season to stir up watchmen on the wall. There's ministries all over the world calling themselves watchmen on the wall. It's intercessors praying for revival, praying for what God wants to see happening. And uh, intercessory spirit prayer is your highest call from God. It is you co-working with the Spirit of God to change the world. Prayer is hard work and sacrifice with a great reward. And that reward is unspeakable joy from Father that you come through those who are prepared to be intercessors. One of my, my heroes, Lo Ingle, is, is an apostle of prayer internationally. He's, man, he's just, it's just fun to watch him, especially even when he pray. Uh, he's being educated by the Koreans, so he makes a lot of funny moves when he pray. Uh, he in heaven is looking for an intercessor that groans with him on earth. God is looking for intercessors who will groan with what is in heaven here on earth. It means that what comes out of my mouth is the callings of God, the word, the groaning of God to change this environment. God is looking for someone with skin on that will operate on his behalf. In the same way that Jesus had to come to earth to have skin on, to die in our place, hear this, God needs people with skin on to say what's in heaven here on earth. That we call intercessors. Those who stand in the gap of heaven to say what's in heaven and, and release it on earth. And you never stop doing that. So prayer is the key to your revival, to our revival. You will never find any revival in the world. I've seen a lot of them that did not start with intense prayer. People who pray. And prayer is our connection with the Father. Are you still here? I want to pray over you. And if, if you feel this morning stirred up by Holy Spirit to change your lifestyle, to become an instrument of heaven here on earth. And even if you don't know how to do it, it's fine. God's just looking for a willing heart to say, here I am, Lord. Use me that through my mouth, my declarations and my prayers, I will change the environment. If, if that's for you, that you feel God is speaking to you, please stand or kneel, whatever you want to do, just to dedicate yourself. Now, now, the miracle happening now as I'm praying for you is, is really a miracle because the Holy Spirit, that's also the spirit of intercession, I'm praying to come upon you. That Holy Spirit, the one that intercedes through us while we don't know what to pray, will come and rest on you. And therefore, we ask you, Father, let the Holy Spirit the intercessor, just come upon us. <sighs> Holy Spirit, we need you to actually do what God has called us to do. We need you, Lord. We are missing the mark so many times. We're all guilty. And Lord, we just want to be like you. Jesus, we want to be like you. <laughs> and as we watch you, how you've spent time of Father, sometimes through the night, early mornings, how you were dependent on Father God, we want to be like you, Lord. And we believe, Jesus, 
declared the truth from heaven on earth. He only did what he saw Father doing. He only prayed what Father was praying. We want to be like you, Jesus. We want your heart, your passion, your vision, your words, your mindset. And we want to bring the goodness of God down into this world. You've paid the full price for us, Jesus, so we don't want to miss out on anything you've paid for us. We want to take the full package deal and release it through our prayers and our declarations. And I pray for each one in this house, any, everyone online, Holy Spirit, just fall on them in a fresh new way. Change their minds, their hearts, their passion. Lord, let us not be the same after today. We don't want to be the same. We want to be changed majorly, totally, in every area. I want to be changed, Lord. To be a prayer warrior, an intercessor, a declarer, a releaser of truth from heaven here on earth. Use our mouths, our hearts, our tongues. We ask it, Lord, in Jesus' name. Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, come. And if you can lift your hands just as a token of total surrender. Come, Lord. Just fill us, fill us, fill us. Fill us. Fill me. Come, Holy Spirit. Deliver us from lies, deception, laziness, wrong theology. Passiveness. Deliver us, Lord, from prayerlessness. Deliver us, Lord, from things that's blocking the move and the flow of your spirit. Deliver us from that, Lord, we pray. And ultimately, Lord, use our prayers in this season to bring revival, to bring heaven down, and from a revival to bring a reformation, a transformation of this city, of this nation. And we know everything starts with the revival. Reform us, transform us, Lord. We welcome your Holy Spirit to keep on teaching us, motivating us, mobilizing. And Lord, I pray out of this crowd, this beautiful church, and those online, that you raise an army, a mighty army, that will not be afraid, that will run with what you have given them, that they will be orators, it will be the voice of heaven on earth in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Over to John. Now you know why we wanted him. Can we just appreciate Wim Sodom? <laughs> let us not just be hearers of the word, but let us be doers. Amen? I'll be checking up on you. And the Lord bless you. May this be, be something that really gets anchored into our lives. And let's grow in this area. And uh, we're going to see amazing things within our own lives and our families in this region and, and beyond. But it, it comes from this place. Hallelujah. So, so grateful. Thanks, Oral. Thank you so much. The Lord bless you. Walk in peace. It's silly season out there. But no, no, no. We have the Prince of Peace. And we have joy. So let's be in Him. And let's carry that and release it to people we come into contact with. Hallelujah. Have an awesome day. Bless you.